Hey guys, I'm Dylan John. I've been teaching Final Cut for over six years, and like we do on this channel, let's cut out the fluff and get into the good stuff. Look at this shot. Now look at this one. Why does this second shot seem more interesting and engaging? Simply because of a little digital motion added in post. This is something commonly done in movies, documentaries, TV shows, any other pieces of content that you'll see online. You may notice it now that I'm bringing it up. It just helps your shots look more dynamic and they end up being more impactful because of it. When I add a push in or pull out in post, I usually like to have it applied to multiple shots in a row. This makes the shots blend together better and have better flow. You may know that you can click this button, go to crop, and hit the Ken Burns effect to help you achieve that slow zoom in. But the problem is that the effect will start slow and then speed up for both clips, making the motion not look fluid. So the solution is this. Press option A to add an adjustment clip and place it over your clips. Now go to Crop, Ken Burns, and adjust the endpoint to be where in the frame you want the movement to end. Now when you play back your timeline, you'll see the motion is happening from shot A to shot B at the same rate, so it seems fluid. But a downside is that maybe you don't want that stop and start motion that happens when you use this built-in Ken Burns effect. Maybe you want it to be a constant motion. The paid option that fixes this and gives you more useful features is called Pro Zooms from my good buddy Dylan Bates, the Final Cut Bro, and it happens to be one of my most used plugins, so I figured I'd mention it in case some of you want to upgrade. There are some presets to create those crash zooms that content creators use, but the Pro Burns presets in the pack creates that slow zoom in that we're wanting. You just adjust the on-screen controls to position where you want the slow zoom to go into. You can hop in your inspector window and turn on onion skin, which lets you line up your subject so that your subject stays in the same spot in the frame during the push in or pull out. He added a sharpening feature that looks great. And what I adjust the most, the type of easing. I don't like the stop and start motion that the built-in Ken Burns effect has. So I switch this to constant, so that right when we get to our adjusted shot, we have a nice consistent zoom. The next tip I have for you is to use one of Final Cut's best new features, in my opinion. There are times when you shoot in a normal frame rate, but when you sit down to edit your footage, you realize that you wish you had shot that footage in slow motion. The solution is simple and works great. With your clip selected, head to the Retime menu and hit Smooth Slow Mo. Or you can press Command R on your clip. Think Command Retime. And then drag the clip out to slow it down. Then hop into the Retime menu and change the video quality to Best Machine Learning. Final Cut will use some voodoo magic to intelligently blend the frames of your shot together so it genuinely looks like you shot the clip in slow motion. And just a heads up, because I know some of you will try this out and be bummed that your slow motion doesn't look smooth on your timeline, you need to render that clip or that section of your timeline where you applied smooth slow-mo. So what I like to do is select the clip, press Control R to just render that clip only, and sometimes you need to do it twice, basically until you see these dots go away and then you'll be able to see what the shot should look like when you export. Another way to spice up boring footage is by using some features from the sponsor of today's video, Artlist. If you saw my recent free plugins video, you might have enjoyed that weird intro from it, and that would not have been possible without Artlist. Their AI image to video tool allowed me to take a picture of a desolate trailer park and turn it into a video, so the fabric flaps and the clouds move. That way, I could use the magnetic mask to put myself into the realistic looking scene. They also just added a crazy amazing update for their AI voiceover tool. So now you can directly upload your audio file and you can select what voice you want to swap yours, essentially. So since the tool is using your original audio, the speed and tone and how you say things in general matches perfectly. This is super useful as a solo creator because sometimes I want narration over my video that is not my boring old voice. So this gives you a lot of creative flexibility. They've also added these new features to their service, so they're 
constantly updating for their user base. And considering they were just a music site when I signed up with them in 2017, I'm stoked that as I've evolved as a creator, they have as well. And I'm really honored that they're down to sponsor videos every now and then to help me keep the lights on in my studio and help me keep churning out these free tutorials every week. So thank you to our list. And if you want to try it out for two months for free, you can go through the link in the description. The next thing you can do to spice up your footage is to learn how to color grade so your shots stop looking amateurish and boring. Most people don't realize how important color grading is. This shot is boring, but this shot with color grading and a little digital motion like we learned intrigues me. It's inviting, it's a bit mysterious, and at the same time, it makes me want to know what's outside of this frame. Let's lower the brightness of our shadows so they're sitting closer to zero IRE on the Luma waveform to get them closer to what the dark parts of this image should actually look like. We'll leave our highlights the same because if we make these any brighter, we would probably go past 100 IRE here and start erasing details in the very bright parts. Now let's adjust the brightness of our midtones to get a contrast level that looks good. No need to increase the saturation in this shot because adjusting the brightness gave our colors a richer, more saturated look. And if we push any more, we'll get too close to this imaginary line on the vector scope, which means that our colors are way too saturated and are in danger of clipping. Now let's get creative here. So let's bring up another color wheels, hit the mask button and select color mask. And let's make a selection of our reddish orange color here. We'll hit view mask to see what we've selected and we're going to need to adjust our HSL parameters to fine tune our selection better. Click view mask again. And now if we hit outside, we can make some adjustments to everything outside of our mask. So let's create some color contrast by including some of the reddish oranges opposing color, cyan, into these areas outside of the mask. This creates some color depth and alongside the contrast that we added, it just helps our shot to pop a lot more. If this is too much for your taste though, you don't have to push so much color in. Let's rename these layers to keep them organized. Then we could pull up a color curves and add a shape mask around the glass. Click outside so everything outside of the shape mask is affected and pull down the brightness starting from maybe our lower midtones. This is called an isolation mask. It is a great way to highlight important parts in your frame and guide your viewer's eyes into what you want them to look at. Let's bring up a hue saturation curves and I want to just quickly adjust our saturation levels by using our sat versus sat curve to lower the saturation of our most saturated areas and raise the saturation of our least saturated areas to balance everything out. Last but not least, let's finish off our secondary corrections by adding another color curves using our shape mask tool and using this to create an even wider isolation mask that is pretty much a vignette. And to finish off this shot, we'll do what we learned in the beginning of this video and add some digital motion. And I'd say this footage is pretty spiced up. The next thing you can do to spice up boring footage is to use another one of Final Cut's best features in my opinion, and that is the magnetic mask. There are so many ways that you can use this. I talk about how to use this tool for color grading in a few tutorials on the channel and in my color grading course, but since we already touched on that topic, let's try this. Head into your effects browser, look up the radial blur effect, and add this directly to your viewport on your subject. We'll also select the foreground here and we'll click analyze to track the mask to our subject. When we hit done, you'll notice that the effect was applied to the inside of the mask. So we need to go to this little button and hit invert. Then just dial back the amount a bunch, adjust the feather, and now we have this nice dreamy blurred background that kind of looks like this was shot with an anamorphic lens. Definitely a shot that is spiced up a bit. You could even throw on the free prism effect in Final Cut, which will add some chromatic aberration around contrasty edges. This is typically a flaw that you would find in certain lenses, but for some reason, I like the look of it. Using the magnetic mask for adding different effects is great, but if you wanna learn how you can use it in the color grading process, click this video right here and hit that subscribe button right now to learn way more useful Final Cut Pro tidbits and have a great rest of your day.